Hello everyone, Dr Polaris here. Despite their dazzling diversity, all modern birds are members of just one big clade known as Neornithes, which means new birds. As confirmed by recent fossil finds of the Maastrichtian Galloanseran Asterionis, the common ancestor of all Neornithes related at some time during the late Cretaceous. The discovery of Asteriornis also demonstrated that all three major lineages of modern birds, the Paleonaths, the Galloanseres, and Neoaves, had all diverged at least by the Maastrichtian, then successfully survived the KPG extinction event and diversified rapidly during the early Cenozoic. However, Cretaceous fossils of definitive Neornithes are incredibly rare, perhaps hinting that these birds were not especially common or diverse especially when compared to the multitude of other avialans flying around in the forests, shorelines and deserts of the late Cretaceous world. One of the most notable of these were the Anantiornithians, a group whose name I always have a difficult time remembering, with my brain always wanting to refer to them as Anantiornithes for some reason. With a name meaning opposite birds, which I'll explain more in a minute, these incredibly diverse animals were capable flyers, being the first avialans to possess a global range, with at least some forms being able to migrate across areas of open ocean, inhabiting a wide array of niches, from tiny sparrow-like insectivores to probing seed-eaters to relatively large eagle-sized aerial carnivores, and Antionotheans would have mostly resembled modern birds at a quick glance, although if you took a closer look, a number of important differences would start to emerge. The majority of species lacked true beaks, instead possessing often toothy jaws that were formed from an enlarged maxilla and a small premaxilla, a condition also seen in other non-avian dinosaurs. They also retained visible claws on at least some of their wing-supporting digits, a feature that all modern birds, aside from Huatzin chicks, have lost. In addition, while having shortened tails fused into piga styles, and Antionotheans seem to have lacked the lift-generating tail fans present in living birds. Due to this feature, as well as the structure of their shoulder joints being arranged in the opposite way to living species, hence the name opposite birds, it was traditionally thought that these animals were rather primitive poor flyers. However, more recent studies have found that most Antionotheans in fact had good flight capabilities, much like living birds, possessing a similarly complex nervous system and wing feather ligaments. Additionally, the lack of a complex tail fan appears to not have been very relevant for avian flight as a whole, with some extinct birds like the Lithornithids also lacking complex tail feathers, yet were often good flyers, with some forms being capable of soaring flight. Although basal and Antionotheans tended to lack stern keels, derived forms from the late Cretaceous had developed numerous similarities with Neornithene birds including a deeply keeled sternum, narrow furculi, and ulnar quill knobs that indicate increased aerial abilities. The discovery of several incredibly well-preserved juvenile and Antionothean fossils from Myanmar that were contained in amber have shown that these animals had fully modern-type feathers, including barbs, barbules, and hooklets, and an arrangement of the wing feathers that included long flight feathers. In addition, well-preserved embryos of these animals have also been found, with these already possessing strongly ossified skeletons, well-developed wing feathers, and comparatively large brains. This indicates that Enantionotheans produced highly precocial hatchlings, which were able to fly soon after hatching from their eggs. Also, their growth levels appear to have slowed down significantly after hatching, which is very different from most modern birds, which don't begin to fly until they reach almost adult body sizes. At least some species buried their eggs in sediment, as living megapodes do, which also have highly precocial young. However, it must have been awkward for specialised arboreal species to come down to the ground and then excavate a hole in which to lay their eggs. I'd guess that not all species did this, with it being shown that at least one of these animals, specimen MPCM LH26189, represents an altricial juvenile, implying that, like modern birds, Enantionotheans explored multiple reproductive strategies. As noted in the previous episode, the internal relationships of these animals are poorly understood, with the phylogenetic placement of many genera being highly unstable. This is partly due to many species being known from very scrappy remains, but also simply because of different interpretations among paleontologists. 
Is this a problem that even occurs with extinct animal groups that are known from far more complete and plentiful fossils? <laughs> Looking at you, titanosaurs, dromaeosaurids, and abelosauroids. Regardless, an Antionothean probably first diverged from other members of Aviolae during the late Jurassic. Although at the moment all definitive fossils of the group are known from the Cretaceous, with the oldest forms appearing roughly 135 million years ago, the vast majority of early genera hail either from the J-hole biota of northern China or the Los Hoyas formation of Spain, with both fossil-bearing regions producing some very complete and Antionothean remains. Prototeryx from the J-hole biota was one of the most basal forms, being a small starling-sized animal with a body that measured about 10 centimeters or 3.9 inches long and a wingspan of 33 centimeters. It had a round head and pointed snout, with teeth only in the tips of the jaws. Its short and broad wings would have been effective for maneuvering in its forested habitat, with Prototeryx being one of the earliest known bird-like animals that could definitively power its own flight. Like many later Anantionotheans, it possessed a pair of elongated ribbon-like tail feathers that were probably used for display. Other well-known early forms include the Spanish Iberomesornis from circa 125 million years ago. This was another small genus, being about the size of a sparrow, and was probably a forest-dwelling insectivore, although the holotype specimen lacks a skull, so its lifestyle is not known with certainty. As in many other Anantionotheans, the feet were well adapted for perching in trees, with long toes and strong claws. Although their exact classification remains debated, five fairly well-defined families of these animals have been established, with there being many, many isolate taxa whose position is uncertain. One of the more basal families were the Pangornithids, a group that thrived for a relatively short time during the early Cretaceous, between 130 and 113 million years ago. Again probably being mostly arboreal, these animals possessed pointed snouts equipped with small teeth, while their legs were stout and powerfully built. This has led to suggestions that they may have been somewhat woodpecker-like in their ability to climb and cling to tree trunks, although their exact ecology is not well understood. Forms such as Yuan Chu Avis would have somewhat resembled modern cuckoos in appearance, albeit with a pair of elongated tail feathers. Melanosomes sampled from the holotype suggest that the central pair of long tail feathers were dark in colour, and the rest of the tail feathers were either grey or with non-iridescent structural colour. Meanwhile, one relatively large genus, Chiapiavis, even had a tail fan, superficially similar to those of modern birds, which it may have utilised in flight. Pengornithids seem to have been native only to China, and apparently went extinct roughly 113 million years ago although the recent description of a possible bizarre Malagasy representative of the group may mean that these animals survived into the Maastrichtian. This was Falca Takeli, a probably crow-sized genus that was native to the May Verano formation of Madagascar circa 68 to 70 million years ago, possessing an elongated deep rostrum complete with a pair of teeth at the tip, which gave this strange animal a somewhat toucan-like appearance. It's uncertain if the genus was also a frugivore like its modern look-alike. Falca Takeli is also something of a mystery in terms of its classification, with the 2020 study that described it placing it all over the place within Enantionotheans. Another odd group of early forms with disputed ecologies were the Bohyornithids, which were also members of the early Cretaceous J-hole biota. Although most known specimens represent the remains of juveniles, adult individuals of the genus Jaornis were about the size of a pigeon. These animals had an odd mixture of traits, including relatively short snouts equipped with robust teeth and long curved foot claws that were in some ways superficially similar to those of modern birds of prey. It has therefore sometimes been assumed that Bohyornithids were raptorial predators that hunted small vertebrates, though their teeth seem to have been adapted for crushing hard-shelled prey. Given that all members of the group lived in forested ecosystems in close proximity to lakes and rivers, it's conceivable that they might have fed on snails, larger arthropods, and freshwater bivalves. Another group of Anantionotheans that were far more likely to be active carnivores were the Avisaurids. Known only from late Cretaceous deposits in North and South America, these were among the largest of the so-called opposite birds, with powerful taloned feet similar to those of Dromaeosaurids that were capable of grabbing and carrying relatively large vertebrate prey. Most species are known from very scrappy remains, so we don't know whether this predatory lifestyle applied to all members of the group, 
although the type genus Avisaurus was almost certainly a somewhat eagle-like carnivore, known only from the very distinctive remains of their tarsometatarsal foot bones, it's nonetheless been found that two species of this genus, native to the Maastrichtian Hell Creek formation of North America, both were large, with a Darwin eye weighing up to 1.2 kilograms or 2.6 pounds, and a Archibaldi weighing up to 1.7 kilograms or 3.7 pounds. This makes both species roughly comparable to the living African hawk eagle in size with their wingspan probably being in the 4 to 5 foot range. Living in humid subtropical swamp forests, Avisaurus likely hunted a variety of lizards, mammals, very young dinosaurs, as well as other members of Aviolae, grabbing them in its talons before tearing them into small pieces with its sharp teeth. Other Avisaurids were even larger, such as the genus Mirake from Campanian Age deposits in Utah. Known from far better material than other members of the family, this was a roughly turkey-sized animal, with its large size, powerful talons and leg tendons, indicating that it was probably an eagle-like raptorial predator. The South American Soro avisaurus was relatively similar, albeit smaller and dwelt in the Maastrichtian Lecho formation of Argentina. Other Anantionotheans, however, have remained controversial when it comes to restoring their proposed lifestyles. These include the Longiterigids, a family of long-snouted forms from the early Cretaceous of China, with sharp teeth found at the tips of their jaws. When combined with their seemingly arborally adapted feet, led paleontologists to assume that these animals were tree-dwelling insectivores or piscivores. However, more recent studies have found direct evidence that longiterigids were frugivores, with the preserved remains of seeds found in the gut contents of two specimens. This finding contradicts morphological analyses, which goes to show that we need to be careful when proposing ecologies for extinct animals based on very little evidence. Forms such as Longiterix itself would have been largely arboreal frugivores, perhaps living a bit like modern barbets or small toucans. While some genera once thought to be arboreal, such as Shenwei Niao, have recently been argued to have been quite terrestrial instead. Like modern larks, this animal seems to have spent a great deal of time on the ground despite also being a competent maneuverable flyer, perhaps feeding on fallen seeds and fruit with its elongated pointy snout. While most Nantionotheans possess toothy jaws, some genera independently develop toothless beaks, with Gobi Terek probably being the most well-known example. This partridge-sized genus was native to the deserts of what is now Mongolia during the Campanian stage of the late Cretaceous, circa 75 to 72 million years ago. A capable flyer, Gobi Terex possessed a pointed, keratinized beak with a rounded end, with it currently being uncertain as to what this animal was eating when alive. Other toothless beaked forms have now been recovered from early Cretaceous deposits, such as the genus Imparavis from the J-hole biota, suggesting that these features may have been more widespread in Antionotheans than was once thought. Given the structure of the wings, this small animal would have been capable of burst flying, able to flap its wings very quickly to enable a rapid takeoff. Meanwhile, the recently described Nava Ornis, which was native to Brazil circa 80 million years ago, was another beaked form, which is known from an almost complete skull, meaning that we have a good idea of what its brain case was like. The structure of its brain indicates that Nava Ornis had a cerebellum that was notably more developed than those of early avialans like Archaeopteryx, but less so than in modern birds. Other Anantionotheans have proved more difficult to classify, but nonetheless possessed a whole host of different adaptations that are quite similar to those of living birds. Despite many of these animals seemingly being specialised for a life spent in the trees, some genera such as Hollandia from Campanian Mongolia were long-legged terrestrial forms, possibly similar to modern roadrunners. In addition, fossilised footprints and very scrappy remains recovered from Australia have hinted at the presence of large crane-sized species that lived there. Other big long-legged forms include the genus Lectavis from the Maastrichtian of Argentina, which was then a lush coastal region, weighing roughly 1.2 kilograms or 2.5 pounds. This animal would have been superficially similar to living shorebirds, probably spending much of its time combing beaches looking for small invertebrates to eat. Other members of the clade that lived in or near marine settings, such as the Appalachian Halimornis, the Australian Nanantius, and the Argentinian Martinavis, may have been vaguely gull-like animals with seafood diets. 
In addition, while some genera such as Parvavis and Kratoavis were tiny, being comparable to hummingbirds in size, forms like Younger Volucris possessed widely spaced toes that seemed to be an adaptation for diving. Other novel genera include Brevi Rosteravis, another early Cretaceous Chinese animal, albeit one with rather unique adaptations, with it possessing a short blunt snout and an extremely elongated hyoid bone indicating the presence of a very long tongue that was able to lap up insects and or nectar. Despite this staggering amount of diversity, Enantionotheans died out during the KPG extinction event. The reasons for their ultimate demise is still debated, although it probably has at least something to do with the specialised forest-dwelling habits of most species, which put them at a disadvantage when the world was ravaged by global wildfires after the bolide impact. It's theorised that the ancestors of all modern birds were largely terrestrial generalists that inhabited mostly inland, freshwater-adjacent environments, ecosystems which were less heavily impacted by the effects of the asteroid strike. It's also been argued that their reproductive strategies and feather molting patterns may have played a role as well, with the parental care provided by neonathene birds perhaps being an important factor in their survival. Regardless, Enantionotheans sadly vanished 66 million years ago, with their demise allowing for the spectacular rise of all of the familiar modern birds of today, although they absolutely should not be considered inferior animals because of this. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering another group of flying archosaurs, in this case being the pterosaur radiations of the Jurassic, which would lead to the very first truly large members of that group. See you again soon. Cheerio.